Nigeria's sustenance has over the years been hinged on a monolithic economy with the discovery of crude oil in Oloibiri Bios State in 1956. It has been largely dependent on the oil sector and faced with the need for diversification. The country is focused on a hybrid of economic structure that blends oil with agriculture, but the former has remained consistent as economic mainstay ahead of the latter over the years, leaving the nation vulnerable to the many shocks associated with fluctuating global oil prices, diminishing purchase by large economies such as America, the growing threat of the emergence of more renewable alternative energy resources, the menace of oil theft and much more. Experts believe that if Africa's largest economy, which has struggled with diversification, is to make a comeback as an economic powerhouse reminiscent of the glorious agricultural era, Nigeria has the clear option of turning to her water from the Atlantic Ocean to the various inland waters, making more than 65% of her geography with all the resources and inherent in those waters and the various economic activities that generate from transportation to fishing, aquaculture, the shipping trade and allied services. With Nigeria's recent gains in reducing the menace of piracy and sea criminalities, the nation's seas have become safer and at coast calmer. The conditions are now conducive for Nigeria's blue economy to thrive. It is increasingly being accepted that the country's future lies in the blue economy. With a coastline bordering the Atlantic Ocean, from Badagri in Lagos to Bakasi in Cross River State. So I want to see Nigeria blue.
You said that we would always be without you, after lost at sea. Through the darkness, you'd hide with me like the wind, we'd be wild and free. You said you'd follow me anywhere. In your eyes, tell me you won't be there. Now I'm running away, my dear, from myself and the truth I fear. My heart is beating, I can't see clear how I'm wishing that you were here. You said you follow me, yeah. With your eyes, tell me you Can you hear me, SOS? Help me put my mind to rest. We're gonna make the loop. I found a weed in a bag of gold. I can feel your love pulling me up from the underground. I don't need my drugs. We could be more than just part time lovers. I can feel your touch picking me up from the underground. I don't need my drugs. We could be more than just part time lovers. We could be more than just part time lovers. We can be more than just part time Kindly please be upstanding as the procession makes its entry into the auditorium. Thank you.
thank you before we take our seats I want before we take our seats that's what I said <laughs> we will start off with the Nigerian national anthem the Nigerian national anthem please Can we sing it together? All right. The Unilag Anthem, please. standing as we take the opening prayer which is the second stanza of the Nigerian national anthem O God of creation direct a noble cause guide our leaders right Help our youths the truth to know In love and honesty to grow And live in just and true Great love to heights attain To build a nation where peace and justice shall reign. Now you are permitted to please take your seats. May I invite my colleague, Professor T. Samuel, to acknowledge all our guests and introduce our special guest and university administration. Professor T. Samuel. Thank you, Professor Ramosu. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my pleasure this morning to welcome you to University of Lagos, the University of First Choice, and you can say that again. 
thank you very much. And it is the maiden annual lecture of the Institute of Maritime Studies of our great university. And so I welcome you warmly. For those who are stepping on our compound for the first time, we say a warm welcome. For those who have been here before, we also welcome you. This is the only university that you can actually assess by land, by air, and by the seas. Please give us a round of applause. Thank you. And the theme for the lecture is from crude to blue. Nigeria's blue economy, the imperative of maritime domain awareness and good governance. It's my pleasure to say that this morning we have in the house already our distinguished guests. Also, we have all the management complete of her university. And so I'll do the introduction. Permit me this morning to say that the one who is in charge and making sure that University of Lagos is channeling the right path is no other person but our Vice Chancellor, the 13th Vice Chancellor, Professor Fola Shade Ogushola, FAS. Of course, let me quickly say that this morning, we also have in the house, chairing this occasion, Dr. Derry Awoshika. Well, she's unavoidably absent, but she's also sent Mrs. Iyabo Soji Okusoya, Head Corporate and Investment Banking Division, Access Bank PLC. Please give her a round of applause. Let me say that the DG and the CEO of NIMASA, the guest lecturer of the day, is already in the house. Please make it louder and warmer as we welcome Dr. Bashir Jamor, OFR. I recognize in the house the presence of Professor Ayodelia Shenwa, DVCDS, our own DVC Development Services. Please, a round of applause. We warmly welcome Professor Lucian Ochuku, our Deputy Vice Chancellor, MS. Please, a round of applause for him. Our Deputy Vice Chancellor in charge of academic and research, Professor Bola Obo. Please, a round of applause for her. I'm glad to say that the Registrar of our University, Oladejo Aziz Esquire, is also in the house. Please, a round of applause. The University Liberian is also in the house. Please, a round of applause. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, also with us is Dr. Ajani Magdalene Nwawuche, the Permanent Secretary, Federal Ministry of Transportation. Please give them a round of applause. Recognitions will continue while I warmly recognize Captain Yu Eboriame, acting AGM Harbor, and he's representing MD NPA, Nigerian Port Authority. It's a pleasure to have you in our midst, sir. Thank you. One of the board members representing MPA, Mrs. Florence Babalola Smith. It's a pleasure to have you in our midst. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Dr. John Adeyoju, Director of Research and Strategy, representing the Rector, Man Oron. Please, a round of applause for him. It's a pleasure to have you. Captain Tajidin Alao, President, National Association of Master Mariners. We welcome you to the University of Lagos. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, one of those who started this vision is in our midst, and it's always my pleasure to welcome him. 
He was the 12th Vice Chancellor of our university. And so please join me as we warmly welcome Professor Rahman Adebelu, former Vice Chancellor, University of Lagos. Eleventh Vice Chancellor, excuse me. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, also in our midst is one of the strong pillars of our university. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Ayo Oguye. Please, a round of applause for him. <laughs> Dr. Ade is the former DG Nimasa. Incidentally, after finishing as former DG Nimasa, he's also an adjunct lecturer in our university. Please give him a round of applause. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we will continue recognitions, but permit me to say we will start this program in earnest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Onke Samuel. May I respectfully call the Vice Chancellor? Okay. Um, before I call on the Vice Chancellor, please permit me. The Director of the Institute of Marine Studies is also an FAS like the Vice Chancellor, Professor Matthew Olusoji Ilori. Please a round of applause for him. <laughs> May I humbly request now that the Vice Chancellor of the University of Lagos, Professor Polasha Deti Ugushola, FAS, make her welcome address to this gathering. Professor Ugushola, please. The chairman of this occasion, Dr. Diri Awushika, ably represented by Mrs. Iabo Sojio Kusoya. The guest speaker, Dr. Bashir Jamo, the DG CEO Nimasa, members of the board of Nimasa here present, the deputy vice chancellors. ANR, Professor Bola Obo, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Management Service, Professor Lucien Chuku, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Development Services, Professor Ayo Ashenua, the Registrar, Oladejo Aziz Esquire, the Bursa, Mrs. Olufumilola Adekunle, the University Librarian, Professor Yetude Zaid, Dr. Ajani Magdalene Mwanuche, the Permanent Secretary, Federal Ministry of Transportation. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the University of Lagos. The Institute of Marine Studies was established in 2013 by the University of Lagos in conjunction with the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, NIMASA, to address the chronic shortage of personnel in Nigerian maritime industry. The maritime industry is key to the proper operation of the Nigerian economy. Bulk goods are exported and imported, mainly through the sea. Therefore, it is a major source of revenue for the government. In 2012, the then De Director General of NIMASA, Mr. Patrick Apobolo Kemi, approached the University of Lagos to inform on the approval by the National Assembly for the establishment of the Institute of Marine Sci Studies in each of the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria, with the University of Lagos as the location for the Southwest. A memorandum of agreement between the two parties states clearly the objectives of this collaboration. 
and these include, but are not limited to, developing academic and research capacity for the maritime industry, exchange of ideas, information, and materials, academic exchange and training, collaborative research in the field of maritime studies, an extension of the cooperation to academic areas that would support each other's mandates and obligations. The MOA also specifically provided for the organization of joint conferences, seminars, symposia, special short-term academic programs subject to consideration and approval by NIMASA. This really speaks to the very um, mandate of University of Lagos, where we're very proud of our town-gown relationships. Professor Are Bailu, the then Vice Chancellor, set up an implementation committee headed by late Professor M. Salau and the modalities for the and the modalities for the commencement of the institute was proposed and approved in the Senate of the University of Lagos in 2013. Based on what NIMASA considered as the main manpower and capacity development needs of the nation for the maritime sector, courses that each of the six maritime institutes were to run were handed over to them. The University of Lagos was mandated to develop and run the following programs at inception. Postgraduate Diploma in Maritime Communication and Navigation, Postgraduate Diploma in Maritime Environmental Studies. NIMASA refurbished the administrative building and two classrooms each in the faculties of engineering and science. Essential training equipment like Global Maritime Distress and Safety System and Bridge Simulator plus computers were procured for the Institute. Two vehicles were purchased also. The programs at the Institute commenced with 35 students, and those programs have increased now to six programs, the additional ones being Postgraduate Diploma in Maritime Administration and Management, Master of Maritime Administration and Management, Master in Hydrographic Surveying, Master of Logistics Supply Chain and Management. Thus far, we have graduated about 180 students from the Institute since inception, while about 293 are currently registered in different programs in our Institute. <laughs> Today, we are having a maiden annual lecture. So the idea of having this annual lecture at the Institute of Marine maritime studies is in accordance with the tradition and customs of knowledge-based institutions, and this was muted in 2021. It was thought that such an occasion should be one that will bring all the captains of the maritime industry together under one roof on a topic of major national interest. We also thought that the speaker must not only be deep in knowledge, on maritime issues, but also a core professional who loves maritime education, who is also versed in current trends in the maritime world. Dr. Jamo OFR won our admiration on many fronts. He has a, he has a PhD in transportation which means he understands the research and the benefits that accrue to nations who take research seriously. He is an industri industry pr practitioner who rose to management level by the stint of hard work. He was there at the inception when the idea of the Institute of Maritime Studies was conceived. He was there when NIMASA released the institutes of the, to the university after an initial five years. He showed compassion 
to the University of Lagos when he declared that the bulk of maritime businesses is in Lagos and the Institute of Maritime Studies in the Southwest Geopolitical Zone deserves a building like others in other zones. And he worked hard to see to the approval of an iconic building for the University of Lagos, the Institute of, of Maritime Studies. And we will invite you when we commission that building. The topic of today's lecture is one that falls squarely within deep interest of Dr. Jamo. He's one of the advocates of the blue economy. He believes that Nigeria will be better off economically and sustainably too if we focus more on the sea than our current attention on the crude oil. Nigeria is blessed as a coastal nation and has a lot of benefits, lot, has a lot to benefit if we take the advantage of the natural providence that we have, the sea. I welcome you all today to this maiden annual lecture of the Institute of Maritime Studies. I believe that you are in for a good ride with Dr. Jamor Uefar in the saddle. Enjoy yourselves. It is our nature in the University of Lagos to welcome our visitors to the natural aquatic splendor of the University of Lagos. So after the lecture, do visit the lagoon front and enjoy the ambience. Welcome to all of you and our doors are open all the time for public-private partnership on, and on marine interest. And we shall be glad to commence business relationship with any captain of the industry here present today. We're looking for partnership because we want our students and our staff to be industry ready, to be relevant to what you need because our job is to provide manpower for industry and organizations. And we want not only to work with you, we want to walk with you and we want to help you to shape the future. So on that note, I want to welcome you all to this maiden lecture and um, say again, welcome to the University of Lagos. Thank you very much, Madam Visima. Please, we can do better. A better round of applause. <laughs> Kindly let me do more recognitions. Please join me as I warmly welcome Mr. Mohammed Abubakar, Acting Board Chairman, Nemasa. Please give him a round of applause. Mrs. Margaret Orakusi, Chairman, Ship Owners Forum. Please give her a round of applause. Also, it's my pleasure to welcome Captain Taiwo Akipelumi, Member Nigerian Ship Owners Association. And by extension, we warmly welcome all ship owners. Thank you very much for being part of this gathering. Please let's give them a round of applause. Chief Isaac Jolakbamo, Nigerian Ship Owners Association. Please a round of applause for him. Of course, last but not the least, Mrs. Chiazo Anishere, SAN, Patroness, Unilag Maritime Forum. Please give her a round of applause. Let me say that this gathering is hybrid and so I want to extend the welcome and the warm wishes to all those who've joined us online to say that indeed, like our Vice Chancellor said, you're in for a good ride. Please let's give ourselves a round of applause. It's now time to listen to the opening speech by the Chairman, Dr. Deria Woshika, MFRMI. Chairman, Access Bank PLC, but unavoidably absent and ably represented this morning by Mrs. Iyabo Soji Okosoya. Please give her a round of applause.
Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. This is the Alma matter for my late husband who is resting in the Lord now. Um, so it is with a deep sense of gratitude and honor that I stepped into the grounds of the University of Lagos today. I'm not very well schooled in public service, so I will stand on all existing protocols uh, that the able vice chancellor, you know, has um, laid before me <laughs> before I stepped here this morning. I bring you extremely good wishes from the chairman of Access Bank, Dr. Jerry Awashika, who is unavoidably absent. I will try to do justice to the speech that she prepared herself uh, and to, to warmly uh, ask you to participate as much as you can in the events uh, that, we, that we'll enjoy here today. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by first welcoming each one of you to this special event. It must be a very proud occasion for the university community the Institute of Maritime Studies, and all the stakeholders gathered here today to witness this maiden annual lecture series organized by the Institute of Maritime Studies of University of Lagos. It is truly an honor for me not only to participate in this maiden lecture series, but also to serve as the chairman of the occasion. I would like, therefore, to express my deepest appreciation to the Vice Chancellor, University of Lagos, the chairman, board of IMS, as well as other valuable resources that help to put this epoch event together. Without your efforts, we will not be here today to participate and benefit from the very crucial theme that will guide productive dialogues throughout today. From crude to blue, Nigeria's blue economy, the imperative of maritime domain awareness and good governance. We have gathered here today because of shared understanding and willingness to learn more about the importance and relevance of the marine industry in Nigeria, especially with the increasingly unsustainable economic growth and development of Nigeria powered by crude oil in the last 50 years. In the last one and a half decade, the marine economy is becoming mainstream in public discourse as the nation continues to search for alternatives to help diversify the economy away from crude oil, which is beginning to appear more like a curse than a blessing for the country. Key stakeholders also believe that the blue economy or the marine economy is crucially becoming important because of the need to protect and safeguard the planet through the sustainable ex exploitation of marine resources for the benefit of future generations. Nigeria's blue economy remains largely unexploited, and we have seen significant efforts by various stakeholders in the last 15 years to help change the narratives. The maritime industry is critical to the nation as it accounts for the carriage of over 90% of the exports and imports of the Nigerian trade in crude oil, as well as in non-oil products. It is in the light it is in this light we must see today's epoch event by Unilag's IMS towards improving the maritime domain awareness and good governance of the industry for the realization of the benefits of the blue economy in Nigeria. As we transit from crude to blue, it is indeed essential that we start to position our country to take advantage of the opportunities therein. The Brazilian Earth Summit in 2012 the global e community started what was recognized as the basis for pushing through the importance of marine environment in a sustainable way that has huge potential for boosting socioeconomic development through business opportunities and job creation. A United Nations representative recently defined the blue economy as an economy that comprises a range of economic sectors and related policies that together determine whether the use of ocean resources is sustainable. 
An important challenge of the blue economy is to understand and better manage the many aspects of oceanic sustainability, ranging from sustainable fisheries to ecosystem health to preventing pollution. Secondly, the blue economy challenges us to realize that a sustainable management of ocean resources will require collaboration across borders and sectors through a variety of partnerships and on a scale that has not previously been exploited. Recognizing the strategic importance of the blue economy towards reducing poverty and inequality in Nigeria, the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshiba Johad, on January 17, 2022, launched the Expanded Committee on Sustainable Blue Economy in Nigeria, with a mandate to recommend ways of strengthening the governance framework and infrastructural development of the maritime industry. The membership of the committee clearly underscores the strategic importance of the blue economy to Nigeria, especially at a time of dwindling revenues necessitating an urgent need for economic diversification. Thus, today's event should be seen as another step in furtherance of that concerted effort by stakeholders like IMS, looking at the credentials of the guest speaker, the other resources attending this lecture series physically and remotely, the contagious enthusiasm already felt across the platform, I have no doubt in my mind that we will do justice to the event today by underscoring not only the potentials of the blue economy, but also the imperatives of improving the awareness of the growing relevance of the maritime industry as we transition from crude to blue economy. By the time we end the lecture series, we would have come up with a communique that will map out clear strategies that will contribute meaningfully to the growing shift from crude oil to the blue economy, with focus on sustainable fisheries, maritime connectivity, marine pollution, and plastic debris, among others. Without any doubt, I believe strongly that this annual lecture series among other initiatives by IMS has come to stay. And it will go a long way in keeping the Institute as a prime maritime center, not only in Nigeria, but also across the continent. Clearly, IMS is well positioned to contributing her quota towards building the much needed capacity for the Nigerian maritime industry, as the Institute provides sustainable manpower requirements for contemporary maritime industry. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention as we commence the lecture series proper. Thank you very much, ma'am. She took the speech of the chairman. Thank you, ma'am. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, while she was speaking, we got the privilege and the honor to have with us the Honorable Minister of State for Transportation, Prince Ademola Adegoroye. Please, a warm welcome to him. You're welcome to University of Lagos, sir, and it's a pleasure to have you in our midst. Also, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, representing the Permanent Secretary, Federal Ministry of Transportation, Dr. Ajani Nwawuche, is the Director, Maritime Safety and Security, Federal Ministry of Transportation. Thank you very much. Also, the Director of Regulatory Services of Nigerian Shippers Council, Ms. Ifyoma Ezedima. Please, a round of applause for her. It's a pleasure to have her in our midst. I'm glad to also say that the DG of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, Dr. Ehosa Osahe, is in our midst. Please, a round of applause for him. It's a pleasure to have you, sir. I also... 
I also want to warmly welcome all our deans, all the professors of University of Lagos, all heads of departments of our different faculties, all the directors of different units, and last but not the least, greatest Akokites. They're not here. Greatest of the greatest and the students of University of Lagos. We will do it better so that they know we're here. Greatest Bagba. Greatest Bubu. Greatest University of Lagos students. Thank you. Permit me at this point to welcome the Minister of State to please come and address us. Sir, the podium is yours. The Vice Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Lagos, Professor Mrs. Ogushawa, it is my pleasure to be here this morning. I greet other principal officers of this very, very great university, and I thank God for all of you and for what you are doing to continue to make UNILAG the best after the Abafi Mewala University. It is, it is not in my character to be afraid to say the truth. But the truth of the matter, the truth of the matter is that several years ago, I had decided, because my father was a lawyer, I had decided since I was three, four year old that I was going to be a lawyer. But at the time, I attended the Federal Government College, Idoani, and so when I sat for jam the first time, <laughs> just like some of you as well, when, when I sat for jam, <laughs> my score. My score the first time was 2 1 2, which was a bit, and I had chosen Ife as my first choice. So, on the day my sister, who was already a law student at that university, and a cousin of ours, it was the one who drove all the way from Makure, and we got to Ife. At the Faculty of Law, the jam results was pasted on the board, and so the three of us stood in front of the board and started looking for my name and score. So they started from up. <laughs> Do you understand? Because it was, the way it was numbered, it's, the, it's, the, it's just as you, you have scored higher. So you just come like that. Start from 3, 280 something, and then goes down. And so they started from up. I knew that they were wasting their time. <laughs> I started from the middle. <laughs> because I had a fear idea. I was very playful as a student. Everybody always told me that I was very brilliant, that with the way I went about things, that ordinarily a not, a, a not too brilliant student would have always fail, but I would always pass because I was just brilliant. So I started from the middle. I was looking out for me. I looked from the middle, I looked down a bit. I saw Adigurui 
Adewole, Ademola, 212. I kept quiet. <laughs> I didn't tell them, but I had seen the map. So they looked and looked from 280 down to 270 to 260 to 250. I had seen my mark. I kept quiet. I just hope they will not see it. Eventually, they saw it. And so I had to go and sit for Jam again. I had a very, very devoted, kind, caring in law. My mother's younger sister's husband. Professor Isaac Oluwole Agbede. He was in the, he was a here. In fact, he's an emeritus professor here. Professor Agbede is retired now. You know what Prof did, sir? Prof brought me to, to Lagos, and there were students, LLM students, in the Faculty of Law here. And he spoke to some of them to start taking me and his daughter, Bumi, in Jamb. You know, um, studying for jam, was studying for jam. In at that time, Professor Agbede was the dean of law, so his office as departmental head, head of department of jurisprudence and international law, was vacant. So every morning, we woke up from Ozolo are close here, yeah, and walked to law faculty from 8 a.m. till 2 p.m. studying for jam. And so when I say that Unilag means a lot to me, I know what I'm talking about. It was here. It was there, it was there that I sat for jam, and I got well over 270 in my jam. <laughs> the truth of the matter is that it was a, little, but a bit more competitive and more difficult to gain admission to law faculty in Unilag, because everybody, even top civil servants, retired military officers, all wanted to be in Unilag law. So I still went into a fair and I got admission there. So Unilag means a lot to me. There's no, doubt in my, there's no doubt in my mind that the University of Lagos remains one of the best universities in the whole world. <laughs> and so I feel privileged. I feel privileged that I join here. I come here today to join my brother, my brother and Director General of Nimasa, Dr. Bashir Jamo, um, to wit and witnesses this inaugural lecture. Let me also greet, I don't know if the registrar is there, the Deputy Vice Chancellor is here, the registrar is here, and other principal officers, wonderful people. I know that for anyone to get to that stage in Unilag, you must have excelled. I have no doubt about it. Professor Gushala, I'm very, very proud of you. God bless you and God strengthen you. That standard must not come down, must not fall. It will continue to go up, even in your time, and beyond you in Jesus' name. Amen. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, staff of UNASA, I welcome you all to this lecture. It is my, once again, my pleasure to be here. I'm representing myself, I'm representing my minister, the Minister of Transportation. Dr. Bashir Jamu means a lot to us. NIMASA is our joint project. And by the grace of God, we will take the master to where it should be. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure we can do better for the Honorable Minister of State. Once again, sir, we welcome you to the University of First Choice and Lagos. say it louder. The University of First Choice and Lagos. thank you very much. At this point, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's time to watch a documentary airplay of the historical perspectives of IMS University of Lagos. Media, please. All right, while they're getting ready, Permit me to call at this time Professor Atemola Oremosu 
to read the citation of our guest lecturer. Of course, we have been told to be ready for a good ride. Thank you very much. I'm sure the guest lecturer will tell you his own jam scores. <laughs> Today, the fourth day of April, year 2023, it's my pleasure to invite our guest lecturer to stand in front here while his citation is being read. No, it's being read, sorry. <laughs> For this maiden annual lecture, From Crude to Blue, Nigeria's Blue Economy, the imperative of maritime domain awareness and good governance. Uh, no, no, sorry. Just the issue so that the light. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bashir Yusuf Jamal, officer of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He hails from Kaduna State, Nigeria. He was born more than 50 years ago. Dr. Jamal holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Port Harcourt, specializing in logistics and transport management. As a way of providential intervention to prepare him for the leadership achievements that he has made in the maritime industry and elsewhere, Dr. Jamal has attended several leadership and management courses from such internationally reputed institutions as Harvard University in the United States of America, Oxford University and Cambridge University, both in the United Kingdom. <laughs> Dr. Jamal was also at the International Training Center of the International Labor Organization at Turin, Italy. He was once the, at the Institute of Public-Private Partnership at Washington, D.C as well as the International Law Institute, both in the United States of America. He obtained further training from the Institute for Leadership and Development for Public Good in the USA. He was at the United Kingdom, where he attended another training at the Institute of Public Administration. His other training experience took him to Sweden, where he attended training session at the World Maritime University, among several others. Dr. Bashir Yusuf Jamal commenced his work in the maritime industry in 1994 when he transferred his services from Kaduna State Government to the then National Maritime Authority, NMA. He joined the services of the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, NIMASA, in the year 1993-94 as Assistant Chief Commercial Officer in charge of Eastern and Central Zones. Having attained the management cadre in 2003, Dr. Bashir has held several positions in NIMASA, which include Principal Commercial Officer Operations, Port Services Controller on Port Services Controller Tink and Island Ports, Assistant Chief Commercial Officer Headquarters, Chief Administrative Officer Training, Assistant Director Wet and Dry Cargo Operations, Assistant Director Research, Head Protocol and Logistics, Assistant Director Training, and as an, an Administrator in the Maritime Industry, he was appointed from the Office of the Director of Training to the seat of Director General. <laughs> he is Director General and Chief Executive Officer of the Nigeria Maritime Administration and Safety Agency since March 2020. Dr. Bashir holds membership and fellowship positions in several prestigious national and international professional bodies, among which are Fellow, Institute for Service Excellence and Good Governance, Fellow, Chartered Institute of Administration of Nigeria, Fellow, Institute of Business Development, Fellow, 
Academy of Entrepreneurial Studies, Fellow, Institute of Public Diplomacy and Management, Fellow, Institute of Information Management, Other professional bodies that he belongs include Member Chartered Institute of Personal Management, Member Institute for Maritime Economics, Canada, Member Institute of Logistics, London, Member Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, and Member National Speakers Association and Global Speakers Federation of the United States of America. As the occupier of the seat of Director General and Chief Executive Officer, he has provided commendable leadership for the agency to deliver on its statutory mandate. This has motivated him to organize and facilitate leadership training and manpower development programs. As the head of various units at various times, he provides leadership for a number of officers on training and manpower development within and outside the agency. He's a respected expert in maritime human capacity building, public-private partnership development. Dr. Bashir Jamo is committed to developing other people's potentials. That requires a big round of applause. As a phylogenist, Dr. Bashir Yusuf Jamo has great respect for women folk. A big round of applause for that. This is evidently demonstrated in the ratio of women to men at the directorate level in the agency. According to Vanguard newspaper report of March 15, 2021, during the com commemoration of the 2021 edition of International Women's Day, while hosting the female directors and assistant directors of the agency, Dr. Jamo boasted, and correctly so, that 60% of the directors in his administration at the Nimasa are women. <laughs> if you are a man, don't apply for director job then. <laughs> Permit me to welcome to the microphone Dr. Bashir Yusuf Jamo, who is happily married with children to deliver this first annual guest lecture. Thank you so very much. Nigeria's sustenance has over the years been hinged on a monolithic economy with the discovery of crude oil in Oloibiri Bauhaus State in 1956. It has been largely dependent on the oil sector and faced with the need for diversification. The country is focused on a hybrid of economic structure that blends oil with agriculture, but the former has remained consistent as economic mainstay ahead of the latter over the years, leaving the nation vulnerable to the many shocks associated with fluctuating global oil prices, the diminishing purchase by large economies such as America, the growing threat of the emergence of more renewable alternative energy resources, the menace of all theft, and much more. Experts believe that if Africa's largest economy, which has struggled with diversification, is to make a comeback as an economic powerhouse reminiscent of the glorious agricultural era, Nigeria has the clear option of turning to her water from the Atlantic Ocean to the various inland waters, making more than 65% of her geography with all the resources and inherent in those waters and the various economic activities that generate from transportation to fishing, aquaculture, the shipping trade and allied services. With Nigeria's recent gains in reducing the menace of piracy and sea criminalities, the nation's seas have become safer and a coast calmer. The conditions are now conducive for Nigeria's blue economy to thrive. It is increasingly being accepted that the country's future lies in the blue economy, with a coastline bordering the Atlantic Ocean from Badagri in Lagos to Bakassi in Cross River State. 
so I want to see Nigeria blue. Thank you so very much. We want to see Nigeria blue. I was in the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs and um, I made a statement that by the standard of public speaking, you don't stand on existing protocol. And uh, you know, when you are in, a, in an institution like University of Lagos, whatever you think, if it's diplomacy, you have professor of diplomacy here. If it's grammar, you have a professor of grammar. If it's mathematics, you have professor of mathematics. So when I listened to the chairman saying that I stand on the existing protocol, I was a little bit uh, jittery whether I can do the same. Because before she left, she asked me whether she can stand on existing protocol. <laughs> and I know I am not a firm believer on uh, existing protocol. So when I mentioned that, after my lecture, because I asked the MC to give me a list of protocol. He said, before you start, I will give it to you. By the time I go to the podium, he left me looking around to identify who and who and recognize. So I wasn't too happy. So I attacked him. I said, you promised me to give me the list of protocol. And you said before I start, you will give me. Look at you now, not giving me. OK, I will identify those who are here. For those who are not here, I am apologizing. So after I finish, one professor said, well, Mr. Jemo, I have one thing to tell you. I have been in UN for quite some time. And usually, when you give floor, you will be given five minutes to address the floor. Sometimes, the list of protocol can take you three minutes. And you have a bell. The remaining two minutes, you will not achieve one quarter what you want to say. They will ring the bell and you will have to leave. So one of the Africans decided to come and say, I stand on the existing protocol. <laughs> and he said that much three times. So the UN, most of the UN scribes now adopted the policy of I stand on the existing protocol. So from that day, since this statement is from a diplomat and a professor, I believe I have no right as a standard of public speaking to challenge anybody who says he stands on the existing protocol. So the chairperson, I want to appreciate you for taking the guts to say you stand on the existing protocol. <laughs> Having said that, as a public servant, I cannot ignore my honorable minister, leaving his tight schedule from Abuja to come to Lagos to listen to a lecture that underscore the importance the Federal Ministry of Transportation plays on human capital development in the maritime industry. So, while accepting, standing, or recognizing the protocols already established, I want to recognize my dear brother. Sometimes he can be praying because when we get together, he will remove the cap of the uh, Honorable Minister, and you will see him, uh, you know, whining and dining with any officer that is around him, no matter how young he is. Prince Ademola Adegroy, we welcome you, and we thank you so very much for the history of your jam school. <laughs> I'm here to give a lecture. The MC said I should give my jam school. When the time comes, I will give my jam school. 
Well, and uh, when I always look at the BC, it's remember me, Margaret Thatcher. I am a fan of Margaret Thatcher, and uh, that is what informed me always to look what is good in woman. Margaret Thatcher will not stand before you and say that I'm a woman. She doesn't care. What she wants to deliver, she wants to deliver. Uh, whether she's a woman or she's a man, it doesn't matter. What matters is what value can I add as a leader? And she, le uh, she left this earth with a lot of blueprints, footprints in her own rights as a leader, not as a woman. So uh, I want to appreciate the vice chancellor, the first female vice chancellor of the of the great Akokans. I don't want to enter the politics of uh, uh, Unilag and uh, not others. <laughs> you want me to receive query with great effort. <laughs> well, um, let me also appreciate the chairman of the occasion, Dr. Dari Awosika heavily represented here by a competent uh, hand, and uh, Dr. Medlin Ajani, our headmistress and permanent secretary of the Federal Ministry of Transportation, represented by the Director of Maritime Safety and Security, uh, Mr. Bombata. Also, let me appreciate Mrs. <laughs> for, uh, Akin Soya, Mrs. Akin Soya Soji, and the members of the board, the DBC Development Services, DBC Management Services, DBC Academic Research, and other members of the management of the University of Lagos. I will not end the recognition without recognizing my dear stakeholders. Gentlemen and ladies, most of the gentlemen sitting here, they are the ones anchoring the maritime industry in this country. <laughs> Either as the ship owners or as consultants, ship captains, maritime lawyers, renowned maritime lawyers, and so on. Please, my dear stakeholders, forgive me so that I will not chop all the entire time given to me recognizing each and every one of you. I recognize the most powerful uh, stakeholders that I have in the maritime domain. It's going to be very difficult for us to drive blue economy without these gentlemen. Having said that, I would like to specifically acknowledge and appreciate my dear acting chairman, MD Abubakar, who is here, as well as board members, executive management, top management of the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency. I will also I would also like to appreciate the entire management staff of the University of Lagos, professors, research fellows, doctors, and then most importantly, the great students of University of Akoka. Finally, let me appreciate and thank the gentlemen of the press who work tirelessly to educate our people on what maritime industry is all about. Without them, we will have what we call sea blindness. We know close to nothing about the sea because of the nature of the sea that we have. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my sincere honor 
and privilege to be before you this morning for the medal lecture of the Institute of Maritime Study of University of Lagos. And the topic we want to address today has to do from crude to blue. Now that our crude oil is being threatened, what is the other alternative? This lecture seeks to address areas where if all the participants here can contribute the little they can, Nigeria will be the greatest American country we all strive to see. So I will start the lecture right away. And uh, okay. For those of us who have been here in Nigeria Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, maybe they may not have detail of what Nigeria Maritime Administration and Safety Agency is all about. I try to take a little, uh, you know, overview of the agency. The agency was established in 2007 after the merger between Niger National Maritime Authority and the Joint Maritime Industrial Council, JOMALIC. So we now come up with an agency called Nigeria Maritime Administration and Safety Agency. And the functions of the agency is to regulate, promote maritime safety, security, marine pollution, and maritime labor activities. That is one of the major functions. And then the second function has to do to promote the development of shipping in the international and coastal shipping trade. And what do we tend, what is our own vision? Just like Unilag, we want to be the leading maritime administration in, uh, uh, in Africa, advancing Nigeria's global maritime goals. And we want to achieve and sustain safe, secure shipping, cleaner ocean, and enhanced maritime capacity in line with the global best practices towards the Nigerian economic development. And we have our own Kobalu. I don't think if it's something that uh, I will have to waste much time, this is internal. For anybody that work with the agency, this is the Kobalu we expect from him. On the assumption of duty in March 2020, I and management, we sat down, we look at what are the basic things we tend to achieve, just like any government will produce their own agenda. Some government say seven point agenda, some three, four point agenda, some two, four point agenda. We look at the mandate given to the agency and try to simplify it. Even from the sleeve, if they wake you up as a student, as a uh, staff of the agency, you should be able to say, this is what the management seek to achieve. And in doing so, we created this uh, particular triple S, maritime safety, maritime security, and shipping development. So in terms of maritime safety, that is one of the key cardinal principles for the establishment of the agency. So we try to work tirelessly to ensure that we create safety of navigation, safety of human life, and safety of our own uh, assets and properties that the shipping takes care of worldwide. More than 95% of the international trade is being done through the shipping. So you cannot escape the issue of safety in our own waters. So that is one of the pillars. And then the second pillar has to do with maritime security. Gentlemen and ladies, 
you, you will agree with me. There is nothing you can do without security. Security is no one, number one cardinal principle. And we work tirelessly, hand in hand with the Nigerian Navy. On the part of the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, we deal with what we call non-kinetic approach to maritime security. We try to introduce a kind of palliatives and other things that can cushion the effects that bring the basis of insecurity. Sometimes the issue of insecurity is being triggered or is being introduced or is being provided by the citizenry and the leadership. If you create insecurity, you will have to go and fight insecurity. How do you, how do you create insecurity? You have children. They are due to go to school and they don't have means of going to that school. They remain idle. At the end of the day, the idle mind is a double workshop. They begin to think the unthinkable. They begin to do the undoable. And then they move ahead to create insecurity. And in so doing, the government will have to provide an avenue to fight insecurity. If they give you the budget of amount of money that Nigeria spent in fighting insecurity, you now compare it with the educational sector. You will now agree with me that the issue of fighting insecurity should not be something of concern if at the initial stage you abort the creation of insecurity. The second issue is children may finish school sometimes two, three, five, seven years without employment. So what do they do? They spend most of their time, useful age, reading, but there is no employment and there is no hope. The next thing also, you create insecurity. So in creating insecurity, you have to fight insecurity. In fighting insecurity, most of the money you have to fund the infrastructural development in the country or in the nation, you find it ending in fighting the insecurity and you will, not be, you will not see any tangible things on ground for you to play around and boast of the dividend of democracy or leadership. And then the third aspect is, has to do with the shipping development. Now, to develop shipping, it has so many components. Under the shipping development, you look at the marine environment management, you look at the capacity of other sectors like shipbuilding, ship repairs, fleet expansion, and so many other things lie under the shipping development. So the entire mandate of the Maritime Administration and Safety Agency is being subsumed into the triple S so that the young ones, officers, they can key into and understand what the agency is all about. Now, this is our own mandate, and this is our own uh, Nimasa for you. What next? From crude to blue. What is crude? Crude oil is the mainstay of Nigerian economy as far back as 1959. And when we discover oil, or before the discovery of oil, what was the main issue? in the Nigerian economy. Subsequent slides will show you what and what we have been utilizing to manage our dear country before the advent of the economy. But before then, let me dwell a little bit. I have a slide that gives us an overview of the performance of the maritime security that we are talking about. We thank God there is no how you can achieve blue economy without security. Not only blue economy, in everything we do in our own endeavor. So in so doing, I try to create a kind of historical perspective. From 2018 to 2023, the level of security that we have been fighting. This basically is being achieved through the uh, dedication of the men and women 
of the Nigerian Navy, Nigerian Air Force, Nigerian Army, because the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, by virtue of Section 22 of the Nimasa Act, we have the mandate of maritime security. But we exercise that mandate under the unclosed law of the International Maritime Organization. So sometimes we call it non-kinetic approach. But the kinetic approach, the operational aspect of it in terms of fighting it, is being done by the armed forces headed by the Nigerian Navy. And you can see the successes recorded. From, from 48 attacks to, uh, to uh, in, in 2018, 2019, we experienced 35 attacks. And then to uh, about, let me see, to about uh, in 2020, uh, in 2020 we, we see the attack leveling with 2019, 35, 2021 reduced to only six, 2022 zero, 2023 zero. But in the last week, even though in the last week we received a report of uh, one attack after one and a half years of recording this uh, particular aspect of perspective. Now, sometimes people say you can't deal with something that you cannot measure. Sometimes I tend to agree with that. Sometimes I don't agree with that. If you look at our maritime domain, we usually address that maritime domain awareness. You go to the sea, you look your left, you look your right, look your front, look your back, you will never see anything. In fact, when you see sea, that is when you will now see the concept of the world coming like a football, because the sky look like the sea, and the sea look like the sky. So in all ramification, when you look at it, you will now understand that God is wonderful. You cannot trace anything where you can say, this is where my escape route will be. And that is where the men of the underworld takes cover and the opportunity to address or to strike in terms of creating our maritime insecurity. So you must understand our own maritime domain. The maritime domain awareness gives you overview on how the maritime operates and what and what that comes into it. What is maritime domain awareness? It's an effective understanding of anything associated with the maritime domain that could impact on security, safety, marine environment. Those are the things that we expect to understand when we are discussing the classical blue economy. You must understand the maritime domain awareness because if you don't understand the maritime, it's going to be very difficult for you to start thinking how you are going to maximize the blue economy. Imagine from Badagri to uh, Bakasi, that is Calabar. That's the, our own you know, space of our own coastal water. It's 853 kilometers, 853 kilometers, more than from Lagos to Abuja. All this coastal line is our own water. And how do you police it? How do you manage it? Apart from what you are seeing in terms of movement of 853 kilometers, the water itself, when you look at the surface of the water, what you find at the surface of the sea is different from the second layer of the sea. The type of resources you can get from the surface of the first surface of the sea is also different from the second layer, third layer, up to the base of the sea. So to manage this 
and to understand this is not an, an easy task. If you are traveling from Lagos to Abuja, for instance, begin to look left and right. Put your mind and concept in terms of agriculture. What type of agricultural products you see in different parts of the cities you are passing? Some soil are meant to produce basically grains. Some soil produce probably yam. The one that produces yam is different than the one that produces Irish potato. The one that produces mango is different from the one that produces guava or uh, banana. The same thing in, in, on those layers in the water. If you can have fish, the type of fish that you can get in the second layer of the water is different from the first layer. Some of these aquatic, they like sun, so they can stay and upload at the top level of the sea so that they can get the sunlight. Some doesn't like the sunlight entirely, so they will have to go a little bit lower. And then, like that, down, 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 up to the bed of the sea. The bed of the sea has a lot of things, including crude oil. That is why we put from crude to water, uh, to blue. That is from crude to water. We maximize the utilization of our own waters and the resources. If fish can succeed on the first layer, maybe you go to the second layer, you find shrimps and other things. Now we must put our head to understand this marine, maritime domain awareness and to understand what and what can we get. Now, the blue economy in Nigeria's economic evolution. Um, I'm sure somebody is helping me with this because my hand is not working. Can we go to the next slide? When you look at this, uh, the next slide. Next slide, please. Very good. I made mention at the beginning of the lecture that Nigeria, period to the discovery of oil, certainly we have what we use as our economic mainstay. And at that time, it was agriculture. Different parts of the country, we have different kind of things that we produce. In the West here, we produce rubber, cocoa. When you go to the north, you get granots. Uh, that's what we call granot pyramid. You can see the cocoa, and suddenly you see the advent of oil. And what happened? Instead of us to make maximum use of an alternative, continue to build the enclave in agriculture, and the next thing is abandoning the agriculture and go for the cheaper way, white collar uh, source of income. And today we are in economic crisis. And in the subsequent lecture, we will now define those crises. Nigerian future lies in blue economy with a coastal line bordering to the Atlantic Ocean from Badagri to Bakasi. I just explained that. So if we are having crisis now, the issue now, where to go next, is what I am now saying, the blue economy. You can see the discovery of oil in Olebri in the next slide. That's the first uh, uh, discovery, and the area is still alive. For those who are historian, they can graph that in Olebri well, the first oil well being extracted. And today, we don't have, we have a number of the oil well that moves. Now, we have seen the first discovery, we have seen the first oil. Where are we today, as far as crude oil is concerned? We continue to see the fluctuation of the prices of crude oil. We continue to see the drastic reduction of the countries that patronize our own crude. And they are thinking not only reduction 
in terms of many alternative ways of getting the crude oil. Because more countries that never dreams of discovering oil, today they discover oil. Can you imagine Niger Republic, that they don't even have water, landlocked country. Today they are boasting of discovery of oil. So apart from that, the international community, they look at the enormous resources they are spending in terms of utilization of crude oil. And they begin to think fast. Let us think for the alternative way of energy instead of depending on this oil. And most of these countries, they have their own target. And the target they have in no distant future, probably in the next 10 years, with the advent of electronic vehicles and other things, definitely the crude oil will further go down. Indeed, we will continue to make use of oil. But with the way things are going, with the technology, an introduction of so many technological alternatives to oil, then we have the danger ahead, which the, the world is working hard to face out the fossil oil industry so we have to be aware. Now is a wake-up call. And this wake-up call, there is no other time than now to ensure that we sit down and make maximum use of our own alternative resources. We have so many alternative resources, not only a blue economy, but this lecture tends to dwell on the blue economy. Other issues that concerns the, the, the crude oil, which may come as challenge and negatives, includes the huge cost of clean up and the issue of degradation of our own environment, particularly in the area of Niger Delta. The threat, the, the threat of oil theft, sometimes uh, uh, about five, seven, six months ago, the oil thefts reach a climax whereby the NNPC will pump uh, crude at the end of the tunnel. Nothing comes out because of a lot of men of the underworld that try to, you know, hijack the pipelines originally meant for the export for you and I, for the entire Nigerians. All we have been seeing that. And then globally, we are moving away from forest, uh, Fossil, for, fossil oils and more renewable natural energy sources such as nuclear energy, solar and wind power. As of 2022, the solar energy is the fastest growing source of new electricity in the United States with over 3 million solar unit installations built from 2020 to 2021 alone. The United States invests over $10 billion each year into the new wind project, projects. And wind is now, now the largest source of renewable power in the United States. Now, we have had the challenges and we have seen the dangers ahead. What do we need to do? We need to change the way we are working with our own ocean. Our own ocean must come to bear into our own mind. We walk, we sleep, we wake up, we go to class, we remember the ocean. What is in the ocean? What can we get in the ocean? What type of sector we should build in the ocean? And there is this quote that says that if ocean were a country, it will have been the seventh largest economy in the world with about 2.5 trillion dollars. I think Britain is the seventh, sixth largest economy. So if you combine the entire resources in the ocean, be it fishing, be it shipping, transportation, shipbuilding, and other sectors under the shipping industry. So the ocean 
will be able to be the next seven just behind Brazil. This is uh, a research conducted in 2015 by the, uh, on the Rebuilding Ocean Economy. So you can imagine from 2015 to now, we are talking about eight years, when you update the research, it's going to be much more. So in so doing, we have to indigenize our own economy in terms of blue oil, uh, uh, blue economy. And in doing so, the lecture tends to address some of the sectors and what we can do to make sure that we improve those sectors. Now, what is blue economy? What is blue economy? I have a kind of uh, some definitions here. Dr. S. Thomas in 2021 defines blue economy as a sustainable use of marine resources. There are key words that I want us to take care of. Sustainable. We have been doing blue economy in many ways. But what we are saying now, we must change the way we are doing the blue economy. You can't go to Zampara and start mining gold without advent of technology, without regulatory uh, authorities, without knowing, without government knowing what you are extracting. So if you do that, if you regulate it, and you ensure that you know the quantity of gold that you are go, uh, uh, getting, just like the crude oil, certainly the sectors will now make the country boast much. God bless the whole country. Every, sec every area you go, there is a blessing there. Why should we continue to quarrel and fight? Let's go and concentrate on each area the blessing that God has given us. If you take the literal states, for instance, that is a coastal state, as defined by the Supreme Court. We have eight literal states. In the presentation letter, you will see those eight literal states. They have very unique way of concentrating on the blue economy. And then other states that doesn't have that, we look at the resources they have and let us see how we can change the dynamics of our own economy by improving on those resources. So in terms of blue economy, the sustainable use of marine resources, one, for what? For economic growth. Two, improvement of livelihood. When we will see how we can use it to improve our own economy. Secondly, improve our own livelihood. The issue of use of shrimps and fish, don't have to go into the manual. You try to mechanize it. Create industry. See value chain, that what you can do with the fishing industry. Create jobs. Uh, uh, improve livelihoods and jobs and health of ecosystem. That's under the marine environment management. Now, we have the issue of, you know, ecosystem and other related issues. So we must look at that. Renewable energy, which is one of the cardinal issues. Today, our major problem has to do with energy. We can have wind energy with our own ocean, as we, can, we will see in the subsequent slides. Tourism. Tourism is one of the greatest area also that provides employment. We will also discuss that and see the tourism. So this, all this are blue economy. Climate change, that we are crying loud and wide. We are seeing a lot of things going negatively. Fisheries, waste management, and marine transport. This is the definition by Dr. S. Thomas in 2021. The European Union defined blue economy that encompasses all industries and sectors that relates to ocean, seas, 
and cost, whether based directly in maritime environment or on land, for example, shipping, seafood, energy, energy generation, etc., or seaports, shipyard, and coastal infrastructure. Gentlemen and ladies, these are the key centers that this lecture tends to address. What do we do to change our own perception, to improve and sustain these sectors, and then move ahead? Achieving the SDG 14 hinges on addressing responsible consumption and production of decent work and protect our marine resources. So after the definition, we have to look at how we can sit down, make a decent work to protect our own marine resources. But having said that, the definition has given us about five pillars. And I will now use those five pillars discuss the issues of those sectors, be it shipping, be it maritime transportation, be it seafood and fishing industry. The five elements of the definitions by the two uh, uh, scholars, the European Union and S. Thomas, Doctor, it has sustainable use of ocean resources, that's true. It, it must be for economic growth. So it's not only for your own table and your own family. You go and do fishing and put it on your own table. You have to go for fishing and take it to industry. So see how you can process it and think of exporting it. You have ships that can stay up to three, five, seven days at sea. Doing what? Only fishing with frozen facilities, and then you bring it to the industry, you will see the value chains, people prepare it, wash it. You have for national consumption, and you have for the one for export. And we have these resources in abundance. At, the, at behind, when the vice chancellor was saying that this is the only university, you can access it by air, sea, and land. The first thing I start to say, what and what the building she forgot to pinpoint we are trying to build at the Maritime Institute in the Unilag. The research they are going to conduct to see what they can be able to generate and ensure that we have that's the building there. In fact, we laid the foundation with the Honorable Minister of Transportation two months ago. If not because of some disagreement with the contractor, we'll have gone far on this building, but uh, we are resolving this matter within the next two weeks, and we hope within the next two months this building will go to a certain level. And that is one of the essence, to conduct research at the behind of the Unilag. The water is there. What and what can we get? At the first layer, at the second layer, at the bedrock of the sea and ocean. God has already provided us so the researcher doesn't have to ask us to give him a ticket to go to UK or to go to uh, United States and conduct research. He would just go down the vice chancellor's house and just enter his own canoe and start conducting his own research. So your own research is going to be for economic growth and improved livelihoods. The livelihoods must be improved. The issue of jobs must be improved. The ecosystem preservation, that is the marine environment. Now, let me take, before I forget, let me take the issue of increase in job. Look at the oil sector, since we are moving from crude to blue. How many, how many jobs can and oil industry provide at a given period of time? Or do you take the entire oil industries and calculate how many? And then compare. You take each sector of the maritime 
and begin to describe what and what they, they do and what type of job they can provide. Let me give you a, a typical example. We are about to commence the disbursement of the Cabotage Basel Financing Fund. To allocate about $25 million, the total exposure of the Cabotage Basel Financing Fund is within the region of 360, 80 or we can see in the, few, in the last few months, we have about $350 million. And this $350 million is the 50% of NEMASA's contribution to the fund. And by the, by the guidelines, the primary lending institution will have to provide 15%, uh, no, 35%. And then the ship owners will have to provide 15%. So making 50%. So if we have 350 million as 50% contribution from NIMASA, then you are expecting another 350 million from the primary lending institution and the ship owner. That means another 350 million, $700 million. Now, with $750 million, we expect to give maybe maximum $25 billion for each ship owner to uh, purchase ship. That capacity of ship, direct job alone, can provide not less than 71 individuals. Okay, you divide 25 by 700, how many ships you can pro provide? Under the government guided, ship financing alone. So you can see the number of jobs that the CBFF alone can provide. I have somebody here seated. It, there used to be a time he alone owned 25 ships. 25 ships. So you can imagine if each ship average produce, provides maybe uh, 200 employment, direct and indirect employment, then how much jobs they can be able to provide. So the issue of insecurity, the issue of lack of employment in the country, definitely blue will have to provide it if we are serious about it. Now, let me go to the five pillars. Let me analyze the five pillars. As I said earlier, the five pillars must be looked into because that is going to be our own guiding principle. Blue economy is something that must be sustainable. So to sustain the blue economy, I have a diagram. This diagram is a diagram that I formulated it in, first, the, in the first book I published, Harnessing Nigeria Maritime Asset in 2018. It's still in circulation. This is the, one of the things that I provide. So for you to be able to achieve what we're supposed to achieve in blue economy, I try to summarize the sustainable use of our own ocean resources into what I call the enabling triangle. What are the enablers? And these are the enablers. If you go by the left, you will see policy intervention. From time to time, government must intervene with a policy that will guide and assist in realizing the sustainable blue economy in our own country. It cannot be allowed to be in the hands of me and you that we don't have say. Yes, for me, I may be past part of the policy maker or part of the lawmaker. But ordinary person on the street who doesn't have say may not be able to know, but the researchers should be able to bring out the areas of policies that government must concentrate to ensure that we have a sustainable use of our own ocean resources. And we have been seeing a lot of government interventions. Part of the government intervention is the fleet expansion 
by providing and giving approval for us to disburse the cabotage vessel financing fund. For some times it's been quiet, but we are not sleeping. We are in the last lap. We have consulted with the primary lending institution. We have engaged a consultant. It is our target that this loan cannot be as you, uh, business as usual. We insisted the loan must be one single digit loan. We don't want a situation where the ship owners will have to pay a very clumsy loans. So, and then there are so many other areas, gray areas, administrative charges by the banks, tenor, and other things like that. This is what our consultant and the primary lending institution, they are now trying to harmonize their position and agreed upon. And I spoke with the consultant. He promised me by this weekend he will submit his own report. Immediately he submit the report. We will pass it to the supervising ministry. The supervising ministry, when they are comfortable and they approve, the next thing is disbursement. So I still believe and hope that we are going to disburse this fund before the end of this administration. Now, the policy intervention comes from good governance. So good governance in all strata, in all strata. And um, another policy intervention has to do with the modular plotting dock. We conducted research and we discovered that we don't have much ship owners that can invest heavily in ship repairs industry. We have instances where ships will come from different countries and for them to repair their ships, sometimes they have to go to Togo or uh, Ghana or Cotonou. You can imagine the amount of money in pouring exchange. Our own ship owners will have to move their uh, ships. Some of them, they move their ship from Nigeria to Turkey for only normal maintenance, dry docking. Now, what of the people, what of our engineers that graduated from University of Lagos that can sit down and repair these ships, that can earn their income in foreign exchange? The, law, the, the language of maritime is a foreign currency. So when you repair, you collect foreign currency. An international person will not collect your freight in dollar and come here and pay you services in Naira. So these are the chains. So the government now intervened and bought a brew, brand new, one of the five top modular protein dock in Africa. Even though we had a crisis with the modular protein dock, it's a brand new one. One, the first thing, where do we situate it? It took us a number of years to, see, to get the location where we, because the modular floating dock, I think, is more than three times of this hall. It can sink. You come like a car, you are passing. Your ship will look like a car, you are passing. It will lift you up. And the vessel, no matter how big it is, it will lift you up and do the necessary repairs. So to get the location is another issue. Approval for the location. After we got the approval of the location, we have to now start to think who can give us the facility to operate. We think, we started thinking of the Nigerian Navy, we call def defense jetty, we go to the continental shipyard in MPA. At last, we now agree with the continental shipyard and we are moving it to continental shipyard. We are working hard to make some uh, repairs uh, of the continental shipyard so that we can commence working on that modular floating dock. Gentlemen and ladies, that's to tell you that the agency is still working on blue economy. I have just mentioned the issue of fleet expansion, and I'm, I'm now mentioning the issue of modular protein dock. That's, those are part of the good governance and the intervention policies by the present administration. The, th the third issue that I want to touch, it has to do with uh, there is no country in the world can, that can develop their own maritime industry without a kind of incentives. 
our airlines, the, the, the aircraft owners, they have different type of incentives. They want to import spare parts, they will have to get some incentives. They want to take the aircraft for uh, maintenance, they have to go to central bank and get monetary incentives, get the control price of foreign exchange and other things. But shipping is one of the sector that has been suffering on this. So the first thing we did when we came in 2020 is to try and write to the federal government to see the plea of the ship owners in terms of fiscal incentive. We started with fiscal incentive, which is much easier. That has to do with the duty that you pay. Shipping is capital in intensive. You are going to buy a ship, sometimes a ship may cost you maybe about uh, 50 million US dollars, maybe average, minimum, you, medium, not bigger, if not even larger one. And you are asked to pay 15% duty. The 15% duty is enough for you to buy a cabotage vessel that you can move around and multiply the uh, supply chain. And the ship owners doesn't have option, they, have, they, don't, they will have to pay. And the government granted, in less than one year we got approval for the first time for the physical incentives, where if you import a brand new ship, you pay zero duty. If you buy a, a kind of one year, you pay a little duty. We try to discourage bringing rickety bucket into our own waters. So if you buy, the older you buy, the higher you pay. You know, if you choose to go and buy the rickety bucket, so go and pay high duty. So, and we got that approval. So this is part of good governance in terms of policy intervention. The next one has to do with infrastructure. We have to develop infrastructure. And those infrastructures include the ship itself, the maritime transport. For instance, the agency now look at the sufferings around Apafa axis. We try to monopolize, monopolize the use of own road transportation. Apologies to the professors in road transportation. I think the professors in water transportation and rail transportation must come up with the policies that can stimulate the utilization of water in terms of ferry and other things like that, so that the blue economy also can strive. Nimasa decided to import about four ferry vessels for our own staff, that is five-seater. Ladies and gentlemen, this vessel arrived in Nigeria before the end of this month. We hope the Honorable Ministers of Transportation will have time to come and commission. For the first time, an agency we are involving in transportation. So this is in terms of infrastructure. The infrastructure doesn't stop in terms of shield building, ship repairs, ship uh, acquisition. It also has human elements. The great students of Unilac here, many of them, they enroll into these maritime institutions. When they finish, what do they do? They will have to conduct research. Sometimes they will have to give advices to international partners that want to invest in Nigeria. So what we do, we introduce six maritime training institution in six geopolitical zones. For Lagos, we selected the University of Lagos. That's Southwest. For Southeast, we selected Insuka, and we selected Anambra. For South South, we, we built a whole maritime university. Okerenkuku is working and we now empower the Niger Delta University. In the Northwest, we developed Kaduna State University. We built a number of structures. In the North Central, we built maritime institutions in IBB Lapai University. And then in the Northeast, we have taken University of Keshari at that time because of the insurgency. So, ladies and gentlemen, the issue of insecurity starts from land and to the sea. We have seen the advent of Boko Haram from northeast to northwest. 
and continue to move the wind, sometimes we begin to hear that they are into Lagos. So we must be able to tie our nose in all the geopolitical zones. So that's what we do in terms of infrastructure. In addition to that, the agency tried to develop the concept of the blue economy. Some of these lectures are coming in slides. So I will have to give you, by the time we come to the slide, we pass it. We, we, we build the deep blue project. The deep blue project, for the first time we have seen the display of cooperation, coordination, collaboration, and communications among the government agencies. In fact, I call the project Rice and Beans, where we have Nigerian Air Force, we have the Nigerian Navy, we have the Nigerian Army, we have the DSS, we have the Nigerian Police, we have Niger uh, Marine Police, we have NDLEA, we have uh, uh, immigrations, all working together to ensure that we achieve one goal, one target, to provide maritime security and police our own water. Today, this project is working perfectly and effectively. And then we now have to provide the issue of maritime security framework, which the president signed into law, the suppression of piracy and other maritime related offenses uh, act of 2019. He signed in June, June 2019. Now, by the time Mr. President signed, he has put in, uh, to stop of arrested those criminals, taking them to court, and there is no law to try them. The SPOMO Act now provides the teeth for us to carry them and take them before the court of law. Today, we have more than 20 of them behind the bars. And that taught them a number of lessons, and today we are seeing a number of uh, improvement. Still on the ocean resources, we, uh, the, as you know, the whole world 72% of the world is covered by water. That's how God did it. And when God created the world, 72%, he now, you know, created or made human beings to understand the concept of building ship and put on top of water. Look at the type of loads you put on the ship, and at the end of the day, that ship will never sink. You take a stone, you throw it into the sea, it will go down. You pick a ship, you put it, and you load it with container, 4,000 containers are still standing. You sit down there as if you are sitting down in this podium. So that's what God has created. So in doing so, we must make sure that we maximize and stabilize that one. Ocean provides a sustainable portion of the global population with food. I have discussed that. The seabed issue, which is about 32%, we have a lot of things also to do. Subsequent sli uh, slides will tell us also, apart from what you can drag naturally under the water, today, if you remove the marine cable under the water, your Google will never work. Glow will never work. Because most of those cables that you see is under our own water. If you are following the trends of event two weeks ago, we had to sit down with Ministry of Environment, Ministry, uh, NCC, NIMASA, to see how we can regulate the issue of installing marine cable for the safety purposes. And that will drag a number of uh, you know, revenue for the government in terms of this uh, particular project. I have made mention the, uh, the amount of value that the blue economy provide over 2.5 trillion dollars. So what portion, how much Nigeria intend to scribe from this 2.5 million? That depend on our own seriousness and on you know, sustainability in terms of managing the resources. I was told that I should fast track the, the lecture. Uh, which, is, uh, which is usual. Uh, that's why sometimes I like to give lecture ex tempo. But when you are dealing with professors, you must be guided. <laughs> Otherwise, you get confused somewhere. <laughs> now, uh, also, you have about 350 million jobs that you have to create, 34% offshore crude production. Aquaculture is the fastest growing food and sector pro uh, provisions. Well, uh, let me try to, uh, uh, to fast track it. 
The next slide is on the pillar number four, improve on livelihoods and jobs. So you can see uh, the issue of oil and gas and then the fishery. We, you make comparison. In oil and gas, what type of jobs that you have to provide, while in terms of uh, fisheries, you have to look at what you can provide. I have provided some, a kind of uh, statistical analysis. Shipping port facilities, we have port facility, 90% of the global trade volume and over 70% of the value is carried by sea and handled by ports worldwide. We have six conventional ports in Nigeria, each one striving hard to provide a kind of revenue for the government and for Nigerians. Fishery globally, 350 million jobs provide links to fishery and marine fisheries with 90% of fishery living in developing countries. You, we, we, are sali we, 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 we continue to experience illegal, unregulated, and, and unreported fishing. That also we have to fast track that. We have entered into agreement with the uh, Ag uh, Ministry of Agriculture Department of Fisheries to ensure that when we are going for our own enforcement, the, uh, the officials of the Department of Fisheries, they are with us. Because like a, like a policeman, when he stops you, he asks for particulars. He will be the one to analyze what and what particular you, will, you have and which one you don't have. And how will he address that issue? Similarly, if we see you fishing, the next thing is for the Department of Fishery to identify whether you have certificated uh, license to operate in our own territorial waters. Tourism in 2012, sea tourism increased by 4% despite the global economic crisis and constituted 9% of the global GDP, 9% of the global jobs, and generated about US dollars 1.3 trillion or 6% of the world export earnings. Gentlemen and ladies, the issue of tourism is one of the easiest and the fastest growing sector in terms of the blue economy. If you go to Bay Beach, somebody beating drum alone, he can get money, go and rent his house or even build a house, take his child to school and then earn a living. Beating drums only. Somebody will come and put temporary shade. With that shade, you have to pay something. And you don't feel pain. Somebody sells drinks, pure water, makes money. All these are part of blue economy. How do we organize it? How do we change it and make it a very su sustainable one? All these are part of blue economy. So the issue of um, tourism is something that we have to look at it. Preservation of the ecosystem, and this is very key and very important. Whatever that transit from the ocean is what translates into the land. The wave at the sea control what continues to happen with us here on land. So we have to look at how we can preserve the ecosystem using our own ocean, which provides the largest sources of energies and absorb 25% of CO2 emissions. Coral reefs is the home of about 25% of all marine. Uh, so the national blue economy. Now we have given the background of the blue economy, how it works in generality. What are we doing to ensure that this blue economy strive? In 2018, the Kenyan government did the largest uh, uh, conference in terms of blue economy. And Nigeria was represented at that time by some officials of the Federal Ministry of Transportation and the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency. When we came back, we wrote a report and we sent it to the Vice President, being the chairman of the economic team. It went uh, through a long processes and later it was shifted to the uh, president. And the president in 2021 approved the constitution of the Blue Economy Team. Gentlemen and ladies, the maritime industry's blue economy is one sector. The oil industry's blue economy is another sector. We have different sectors in the blue economy. We have agriculture. We have uh, uh, marine environment. We have so many other sectors. 
So we all come together to see how we can develop the blue economy. And the blue economy comes in four folds. One, the national blue economy. Two, the regional blue economy. Three, the continental. And four, the international. When it is when you develop the national, then you can now start to develop others. You can go to the regional and you start to see how you can sell your product, what you can get, what opportunities you can grab in that particular area. And then subsequently, you continue to move to the continental. We said that we want to be the leading maritime administration in Africa, that means in the continent. So in so doing, we must make sure that we develop our national blue economy to the level that the continent will accept it. After accepting it, we go to international. And the way we market our own crude oil internationally, that's how we will continue to market our own blue economy internationally. That is the national blue economy. And what asset do we have that we can make use of this blue economy? We have 853 kilometers coastal line that is from Badagri to Bakasi. And uh, as I mentioned, with different type of resources. We have 8,573 kilometers of inland waterways. What I mentioned earlier, this 8,573 uh, kilometers of inland waterways caught across about 27 states. When the coastal line have eight states, we have, God bless us with internal waters with about 27 states, you can move around them. So if you have that, why should, uh, you know, Zampara or Kebi come and fight uh, Lagos? They can make use of their own inland waterways. What can live in ocean, can live in internal water, uh, uh, waterways? Water is water. The resources is resources. We are yet to tap the resources of our own internal waterways. The issues of ferries are not there. The modern uh, ships that we can use in our own inland waters are not there. So we continue to sing the song of trying to, you know, dredge River Niger. First of all, let us see the utilization. Let us see the gap on how we can build that. We have 200 nautical miles of exclusive economic zones, 12 nautical miles of territorial waters meant for you to go for fishing and other things that you can do on your own. We have six port compliances I made mention. 21 oil terminals, this was uh, long time research, and 10 jetties, 200 million population, all consumers. If you raise hand with fish like this, so you are expecting not less than uh, 100 million out of 200 million to raise hand, they want to take it. So there is nothing you will go and you know, source from your own seas and ocean that you don't have people looking for it at the national level, not even at the continental, original, or international level. Then we have 28 out of 68 are uh, accessible by water linked to five neighboring countries. I know one time the governor of Kebi State told me that we need your presence in Kebi because there is no week I don't transport rice from Kebi to Niger using our own internal waterways. So earlier I mentioned 27 is 28. 10,000 kilometers of waters that are navigable. These are subject to analysis. Uh, the first one said 8,753. The inland waterways assets, uh, you can see the dimension. I don't have to waste most time. I believe the organizers will have the papers and they will now have to get it. Now, what are the traits? We have the blue economy. We continue to preach on blue economy. What are the threats of the blue economy? That includes piracy. Today, I am happy to announce that uh, every hand is on deck for those players and stakeholders on the issues of maintaining maritime security in our own territorial waters. They are up and doing. The international community recognizes this by various, uh, you know, uh, action taken. Uh, from the first quarter of 2021, Nigeria was removed from the piracy, uh, from the uh, from the most dangerous nation to trade. I think 2022, by the third uh, third quarter, Nigeria was removed one of the most rich country. So, ladies and gentlemen, it means Nigeria is ripe to transit 
from crude to blue, as we are talking today. Another monster is smuggling, illegal oil bunkering, narco, narcotic trafficking, that is drugs trafficking, arms running, that is arms smuggling, non-payment of revenues by government. Uh, we just imported another five bulletproof, uh, seven bulletproof uh, Arisa vessels to increase in patrol and ensure that we, we do manage the issue of plug and post state control. Before now, we don't have such facilities. Sometimes we engage in you know, daily uh, rates of our vessels so that we can go for enforcement. But today, I think by 18th of this month, we will see first consignment of five bulletproof Arisa vessels that will enhance our own uh, efficiency and effectiveness, which will also increase our own revenue in terms of enforcement. Also, human trafficking also has been the, the greatest threat also to blue economy is the sea blindness. I would like to appreciate and thank the Vice Chancellor and her management for introducing this kind of fora. We must engage ourselves, we must educate and sensitize ourselves on what blue economy is all about. So many people, they have the sea blindness, they don't know what even constitutes the blue economy. They hear blue economy, but, but they don't know what and what are the component of blue economy. How do we harness the blue economy? That can only be done through this kind of fora. People that will listen and understand. So many of us here will live here and go and conduct further research. And in so doing, we will be able to educate ourselves more and more. I made mention of the launching of the deep blue assets. We have already gone far on that. Uh, I don't think if it's uh, time for us to uh, deal with that. But. Um, uh, uh, please, can you go back a little bit, the last slide, so that people can see the inner working of the blue, uh, the, the uh, deep blue project. The deep blue project is a, a very uh, modern uh, kind of uh, policy introduced by federal government, which authorized the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency to, uh, you know, purchase array of platforms that can deal with the issue of maritime insecurity. Those components include two special mission aircraft. They have the capacity to move around and snap pictures of what is happening. In the event of any attack, the most important things when you have attack is the response. What time takes for you to respond? As you are responding, you are now deterring these criminals. When they know that, as soon as they strike, somebody out there is waiting for them to attack and for him to get them out. So they will, that will be a, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, drawback. Then we have two special mission helicopters, uh, three special mission helicopters, and 16 armor vehicles that can stand the test of time in our own Niger Delta Creek. In the whole world, the Niger Delta is one of the area that will have a very difficult terrain in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the terrain we have. So we have a specially built ammo tank, which the Nigerian army, they are heading that particular area. And then we have special mission vessels, which they have the dynamic position, and we call it DB Abuja and DB Lagos. They can remain and last at sea for several hours and several days, uh, gathering information. All, all is connected with satellites. The air can speak with the land, the land will speak with the sea. So in so doing, we find a ways of trying to see how we can uh, quickly respond to whatever threat we are having. And in addition to, uh, to that, we have the brain. And the brain is what we call CPOI center, command and control center, whereby in the center we see all that happen at sea, at the, air, at the land, and the air. So they now communicate to the right platform that will now respond to any operational uh, threat. Uh, prospects and the key segments of the blue economy, uh, these are the prospects. I have mentioned it severally in the, in the course, but I'm now going to say it in isolation. For those who want to invest, conduct research, they will now have a stand-alone area they will take. First is maritime transportation. The maritime transportation is being relegated. 
Gentlemen and ladies, many of you, they have gone to Dubai. You pay money. You think that that money is little. They will put you inside uh, one kind, uh, you know, wooden, wooden uh, ferry. You take your lunch there. They will just take you around. They finish with your money. And the money, no, no more. And you think that, yes, that is the relaxation. What stop Nigeria or investors creating ships or ferries with all encompassing? You have a barbing saloon, you have hairdresser, you have beauty saloon, you have uh, beddings. By the end of at the time, by the time you close on Friday, you pay your token, you go and take your room, sit down, relax. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you move around the coast of Africa. Start from Togo, uh, start from Benin Republic, go to Togo, from Togo you go to Ghana, from Ghana you go to Cameroon. You take week by week, and you see how your skin will change. And in so doing, you are creating wealth. The workers of Barbin Saloon will get money. So on Sunday, you have to go to Saloon. If you are a woman, you sit down in the ship, you do your Barbin Saloon. If you are a man, you cut your hair. If you want to do your party care and manicure, you have it there. You go and sit down, they do it for you. When you go to Ghana, you come out, you relax, you buy what you can, you go back and sit down. You don't have to go alone, you can go with your children. Your children will begin to know and understand Africa. They will have to understand the continent. You start with the regional and other things like that. That is where the blue economy starts. That is where the sustainability starts. Put five as a trial and see what you can get by the end of this year. That's blue economy for you. So maritime transportation is one. Fisheries, we are already into fisheries. Those who are in fisheries, uh, Mrs. Orakasi was the president of the Association of Fishing Trawlers Associations of Nigeria. Due to lack of security, now most of their vessels are no longer there. I hope and I pray they will now come back and we will see them with full force to see huge amount of revenue accrued under the fisheries and then add to our own GDP. Aquatic culture, other things, I have given some pictures of all these things there. Renewable energy, this is one of the most important key. I always look at this renewable energy and, re and shake my head. It's just the wind from the sea that can provide uh, light for us. How much will it cost? Nothing. So for those investors, this, this is the area that they can invest. And this is where the world is going through. We will have to explore this part, uh, time, uh, this, this part of the area. Tourism, when you introduce the peri, you create tourism. There are so many tourism uh, areas in the whole countries. So when you go to Ondo on Ogun State, so many historical perspectives, you go through the uh, uh, use of Perry and other things like that. All these are blue economy. And uh, the type of job generated by tourism, I repeat, it cannot be overemphasized. Climate change, waste management, even the waste we are having. Uh, Nimasa, we introduce what you call marine litter marshals, so we do that. And then uh, I mentioned the issue of um, ports and logistics, shipping, dockyards, mar uh, marine tourism, dredging, offshore oil and, oil and gas exploration, renewable energy, maritime fabrications. We just try to introduce foundry. Uh, Nimasa engage in the nationwide removal of wrecks. When you remove the wrecks, that wreck is like diamond. So we intend now to go and start building a foundry where we can melt those iron and produce so many things, including giving it to the shipbuilding industry. They can utilize it for building some of the ships that we are looking for. Waste management and, and then fishing and aquaculture, I have discussed that. Opportunities from blue economy tourism in Nigeria. Gentlemen, I like this map so, uh, so much. If you look at that, it's Badagri. You look at this, it's Bakasi. All these reds that you see, that are, these are towns and cities. Uh, this is the map of Nigeria. That is the coastal line. So you start from Badagri, you come here, Bakasi. If, for instance, now, we try and see how we can create cities between one dot of red to another dot of red, 
how can these criminals find a way to enter into, uh, to come out from the country and enter into the sea? The down here is sea, and the over there is the hinterland. So even for us to try and close these gaps is another area of security that we will have to provide. And in so doing, you can see what you can do in terms of tourism. You try to create the issue of a beach and other things like that. In all this, because you have so many countries there, you establish number of infrastructures, build hospitality industry, hotels and other things. You go to some countries, if they give you room to a hotel, if you see view, the price is different with the one that is not see view. So all this one can facilitate and introduce ways and means of improving on our own blue economy. This is an interesting map. I, like, I love that map very much. So for those who, uh, who can uh, tap into the tourism, that will guide them. Also, opportunities goes to cargo operations, tip during services, warehousing, bonded terminal, haulage, shipbuilding, ship repairs, ship cargo and surveying ship management. Also, there are opportunities in terms of oil and gas. It's all blue economy. Tank pumps, packaging, you know, even to uh, packaging. You package how you palletize your own uh, cargo and then shift it into containers. It's also something that is, we don't have much uh, well-established packaging industry. Oil bunkering services, the legal one, not illegal one. No ship come to Nigeria without buy, buy, buying bunkers. You have your own car, you go to the filling station and buy. Begins to imagine, what is the turnover of ship coming to Nigeria every month? You have more than 1,000 ships coming. Those who are loading uh, oil and those who are bringing cargoes. Where do they consume oil? You, if I ask you, you say that you go to filling station. But here we don't have filling station. All these things, all these services have been done by major oil marketers, which they are not Nigerians. Why? Because we didn't create avenue for us to build the oil banking services. That was a time during Umari El Adua where a committee was established as in chair by Captain Hannah Chu, he's not here. I was a member. We, we built and made a lot of recommendations, but at the end of the day, we didn't see the light of the day. The billions we are losing in terms of legal oil bunkering, in terms of bunkers that our own ships are getting, is enormous. The, the Wari refinery was specifically uh, established to produce the lighter oil that our own ships can consume. To do today, uh, uh, Wari refinery is no longer working, so we have to allow people to be bringing the bunkers for our own ships just for nothing. Nigeria is drying, uh, you know, hard. We are becoming skeleton. That's another area of important ship and cargo surveying, ship, sh uh, ship chandling. This is something that you can do it alone. You just register, you get your chandling certificate, you go to the ship. Ship leave, uh, leave uh, United Kingdom and come to Nigeria for at least 20 days or so, or 12, 14 days. Their food finish, their meat finish, their provision finish. You go and provide them. They pay you in dollar. Even single water that you provide, the meat you are providing. Some of them, they are sick. They want to go to hospital. You have to take them to hospital. They have to pay in dollars. All these are blue economy. How do you structure it? How do you develop the sector? Short sea services, you, uh, the, like what is happening in Dubai. You create that. In Victoria Island, you find a, way, a, a design way where you have some attractive things, Equa Atlantic and other things, you take your short services and move around and people see it and pay you some certain token. Ship brokerage, you broker a uh, ship just like uh, uh, you, you do brokerage for, for so many other things you do. Ship agency also, that one is also ship financing, training and for show sh and ship board personnel, marine insurance services, legal and admiralty services, I ICT services. For those who are studying ICT, you will now concentrate on what type of things that you have to provide. We have AIS with uh, our own ships and other things. How do you maintain it? How do you manage it? We have GMDSS, Global Maritime Distress System. How do you key into the issue of marine insurance? The insurance companies, they are no longer. You will see cost and freight without insurance. The component of insurance is relegated. Our insurance companies, they are becoming down. 
So the issue of blue economy is so enormous. You find yourself now. Now the issue of ship finances. You have to repair the ship, you have to buy the ship, you have to finance the ship. You know, the training also. Those professors also, they have to, I have so many professors here that engage in training of my personnel and services. So uh, we have so many ways of driving the economy. I think because of time, I cannot uh, continue with those uh, how we do. I mentioned about the disbursement of the Carbotage Vessel Financing Fund, the REC removal in terms of the issue of uh, building the, uh, uh, the foundry. Then the issue of uh, CBFF, interestingly, immediately we start blowing whistles that we are going to disburse the CBFF. The NNPC came to us, oh, we are interested. You are going to give 15%, uh, uh, 50%? Yes. Okay, let's see what we can do. P Primary lending institution, they are given 35%, they have money. We NNPC, we need ship to carry our own cargo. So we can give you specification to go and buy the ship. In so doing, they offer that we are going to give you 9%. The ship owners, see them here. Instead of you, they started crying to me, we don't have 15%. I say, go and have partnership. Get the money and get the 15% and see how you can pay. Suddenly, NNPC came. They say, oh, we can offer 9% out of 15%. You, to show that you are serious, you are the owner, bring 6%. When we give you 9%, we will take over the ship and provide the cargo. So when we provide the cargo, you don't have any liability. You go to rest only for you to manage the ship. NNPC will now continue to deduct their 9% from the cargo they are engaging the ship for. So that is uh, that is that slide what it's all over about. So, gentlemen and ladies, you see we are moving gradually well. But what we like is lack of information. And this fora always provide this platform for people to understand and know. The capacity building, the NIMASA introduced, in addition to building maritime training institution, we wanted a model like Philippines, Indonesia, and Singapore, where they train their people and send them abroad to go and work. We train so far in the National CPR, under the National CPR's development program in India, Egypt, uh, Greece and UK. We train so far more than 2,041. Some of them through our own personal scholarship that the agency do pay. Uh, I have given the analysis. The NSDP cadet in 2021, we have 200 in Egypt, Greece and India. NSDP cadet 2022, 28, 428 Greece and India. NSDP in employed graduates 800 on board vessels worldwide. I made mention waste management, you know, from waste to wealth. So we have, uh, I didn't, okay. Well, we have what we call uh, marine litter marshals. Marine litter marshals, we, 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 we establish them and give them some tokens. Today we have about 1,190 now on payroll. We pay them a token of 90 uh, 50,000, uh, 50, and the supervisors, we give them 100,000. What do they do? One, they provide intelligence information from communities, how we can combat the issue of maritime insecurity. And second, they help us to inform us of the uh, you know, debris, marine litters in our own water, so that we can go and remove them to make sure that the marine environment is clean. And then we recycle it. So that is uh, the marine litter marshals we have there. Uh, the issue of modular floating dock, that's when we strike the deal with MPA to use continental shipyard. And then building a blue economic capacity, we continue to uh, create ways of uh, maritime training institution. The picture here is the Honorable Minister of Transportation, and the middle is the permanent secretary, and myself at the tall end here in the University of Lagos here, when we are you know, doing the groundbreaking of this particular building. You can see there myself and the uh, DVC uh, there uh, giving me a plaque the day we now do the uh, groundbreaking of this building. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are getting to the end of the lecture, especially the warning given to me. The making of the Nigerian Blue Economy document, uh, that's my humble self. The beginning when the inauguration of the committee. That was the former Minister of Transportation, Rotumi Amechi, 
and then myself at the middle and the vice president and the chairman of the committee of this uh, uh, blue economy. We have the basis of the blue economy, unfolding the blue economy is a, is a, with a strategic roadmap. That also I will leave it uh, for the organizers to distribute faces by faces. Please, next slide, so that uh, uh, we can talk on the same uh, page. Now, this is the faces of the blue economy when we are unfolding it, and these are like uh, the action plan from phase one to phase uh, eight, and each one we have to uh, give the descriptions of what we are doing. The next step and the most important thing is that stakeholders engagement. We look at that map and we say look since the blue economy is going to dwell on national not only on federal level at the federal level so we try to engage the state governors. Each state governor we discuss let him tell us where the area of his comparative advantage and priority in terms of the blue economy. We try to discuss and share our own knowledge on the blue economy and each state governor they gave us their own like and we're now incorporated in the policy from uh, top left is the governor of Lagos state on door and uh, we have uh, delta and uh, i think uh, that one is uh, rivers we have Bielsa uh, at the end so we engage them and as, as we engage them we are now engaging the university with this particular lecture to come to uh, the table and let us see in terms of research. I have, I must recognize and appreciate uh, Professor e, uh, Oye uh, Oni Oyela, which is one of those people that are, that are working towards the facts and figures, the facts and figures of our own blue economy, so that we can know where to go. And he is a professor here in Unilag and a dean of. Uh, uh, geography. So uh, we have been engaging and Unilag is one of the top list. They are the one now giving us part and figures. If we say we have fish, where do we have fish? What is the quantum of the fish? If we say we have gold, where do we have gold? They are working now to tell us where we can get those things. Immediate recommendations. Uh, while we await comprehensive national policy for purely kick uh, fully kick off into the gear, we must all, uh, uh, all for starters, become the blue ambassadors. So the students, the professors, the gentlemen and ladies, gentlemen of the press, we, I implore each and every one of you to be a blue economy ambassador. The blue economy is a very, is, is every Nigerian's economy. Civil society have a role to play in the galvanizing the greater national awareness and participation so we all have to put our hand in deck. We don't have to say, oh, Nimasa is Nimasa business, is the Ministry of Environment business, is everybody business. We must rethink our waters. We need a total rethink from the ceremonial view of the commercial view, events such as Arugungu Festival, as well as others must be redesigned and repackaged from standpoint of the blue economy. That is the sustainability. We must internationally work to banish sea blindness amongst Nigerians. That's the duty of uh, the academia where we have here. Uh, make, uh, make, make sea world and water related activities more mainstream and attractive. Private sector partnership with government must be harmonized for the maritime cluster development. Shipyard expansion and shipbuilding expansion must be looked into. You know, what we usually observe, the oceans are a way of life. We go there, we fish, we use our vessel and we sail. We have a robust economy in the sea. So it is uh, a quote by Swege, uh, .com. So, and um, life is like the ocean itself. It moves like waves. It will try to knock you down, you know, and push you back. That is the sea. If you look at the seaweed, it will be moving like this. So if you are a human being, it's like that. To where you started. You start from here, it will push you this side and it push you back. But once you fight through them, the entire ocean 
remain yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We want Nigeria blue. Thank you for listening. You will agree with me that that was a very well researched and very well delivered lecture. The chairperson, ma'am, you also agree with me, this is the reason why we didn't tell you his jam score before he started the lecture. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. I think um, we, who also are a medical profession, are taking something home. We used to know of river blindness, now we know of sea blindness. And so we encourage the Vice Chancellor to wear goggles so that she will see clearly from the lagoon front of the Vice Chancellor's chambers. Very quickly, before I call the Chairman for her remarks, please permit me to quickly recognize the following people. Captain Sunday Umoran, Secretary General of Abuja MOU. <laughs> Captain Sunday Umoran. Commodore V.D. Choji, representing the Chief of Training and Operations Naval Headquarters. Please collectively help me appreciate all NIMASA directors and management that are here. We also want to recognize Mr. Fola Ayegusi, the Senior Special Assistant to the Honorable Minister of State of Transportation. And last but not the least, Mr. Akin Oshinawa, Director of Operations, Nigeria Railway Corporation. <laughs> Having listened to this very extensive lecture, permit me now to call on the chairman uh, to now give her remarks uh, about this lecture. Lady Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that was a lecture very, very interesting to listen to. But I think most importantly, it showed us that there's significant potential yet untapped in Nigeria. Nobody is going to develop Nigeria for us. We Nigerians must stand up and do what is right by our nation. I think that today, we've seen that whereas crude gave Nigeria an uplift that is now suspect, the blue economy presents significant potential that generations will make a demand on and for which we all will be proud if we take steps that are required to develop it. Not only do we have abundance by nature, by what God has given unto us. We have over 800 kilometers of coastline that can be developed for many things, including the tourism, including making business positions outside of tourism. And I think that we will not do well as the current uh, crop of Nigerians if we do nothing. I took notes. And I think that personally, there's a lot of work to be done also by the financial services industry in ensuring that the right opportunity and financing is made available to tap into some of these opportunities that we have seen today. Nigeria cannot continue to depend only on crude. We truly, truly must turn blue. 
and turning blue is not just by the array of uh, people in blue that I can see here today, but it's truly that everyone in this room will take charge and do what is right by our nation. I thank you so very much, Dr. Jamal, for all of the work that you put into developing this, and I think that I encourage each one of us to take the notes and get, uh, I hope the organizers will be able to give us uh, the, the project work itself, that's what I want to call it, so that we can take our time to out outline the things that we need to do to help push these uh, uh, conversations forward. Thank you very much for, for enjoying the time there this afternoon. We want to thank you very much. Please, let's give her another round of applause. Thank you. Permit me at this time to call our Vice Chancellor, Professor Falasha Deogunshola, to please come for the presentation of awards to all our guests and those who admit today a reality. Madam Visima. The director of IMS, Professor Ilori, please come as well. The first goes to the Honorable Minister of State of Transportation, Prince Ademola Adegorelli. Please come, sir. behalf of the staff, the Senate, the management of the University of Lagos, and all our students, I would like to present this to you for coming to our institution and to let you know that after we have now won the glasses, we're no longer sea black and uh, we will be contacting you to make sure that University of Lagos, we've started the journey in the area of transportation and certainly we will be contacting you too. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. The next, Ma, you'll still do us the honor. The next award would go to Dr. Jamo, DJ Nimasa. You will agree with me that we went on a ride. The only thing is that we are to buy ships, and I understand that each of those ships comes at almost $50 million. I am just wondering. <laughs> I'm wondering. <laughs> We present, we present to you uh, the Leadership Award in recognition of your pace-setting leadership, which is building the future for the youth and is transforming the maritime industry with vision, creativity, and boldness. Congratulations. Thank you very much, sir. You will agree with me that chairing today was a beautifully done job by our one and only Dr. Awoshika. But she's not here, but she's ably represented by Mrs. Ayabo Soji Okusonya. Please come, ma. Let's give her a round of applause.
This leadership award is presented to Dr. Dere Awoshika in recognition of her commitment to tertiary education and outstanding dedicated services to the nation. We also want to use this to thank the chairing and um, we look forward to continuing working with Access Bank. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we're still doing awards, and let me quickly say, the next person I would call actually started the Institute of Maritime Studies in our university. And so please join me as I call to the podium the 11th Vice Chancellor, Professor Rahman Ade Belo. Please keep clapping until he gets here. Sir, you're wanted here, sir. Please keep clapping until he gets here. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. The whole thing started with the 11th Vice Chancellor and this speaks to continuity in administration as Unilag grows from strength to strength. So for Excellence in Service Award, we present to you, this to you, Professor Belo, in recognition of your exceptional service to the Institute of Maritime Studies and your passion for maritime education. Congratulations. while the 11th Vice Chancellor builds and started IMS. The 12th Vice Chancellor built upon it. So I have the pleasure this morning, this afternoon, to say that there is also an award for Professor Luato Inte Mitayo Ogundipe, but is unavoidably absent. So please, Professor Akimboye, kindly come to collect the gift on his behalf. Please let's keep clapping for him until he goes. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Excellence in Service Award to the 12th Vice Chancellor, Professor Oti Ogudikwe, in recognition of his exceptional service to the Institute of Marine Stud Maritime Studies and his passion for maritime education. As I said before, it's a continuum and we continue to build. Congratulations.
Thank you very much, Ma. While you're still standing there, permit me to call back to the podium, Professor Ramana Debelu. I'm sorry, sir, but you will come back to the podium, sir. <laughs> what we are witnessing today is because 11 started, 12 built on, 13th believed in it. And so the next award goes to our current Vice Chancellor, Professor Falashade Ogushalam. Well, uh, I believe in the of Lagos and continuity. And I'm happy that we have continued in building the institute from where I started. I ended up to Professor Ogundipe and he continued. And I'm happy that uh, Professor Ogunchola has now taken up to the height where I'm sure that building will be commenced and completed in your era. Congratulations. So the recognition of your exceptional service to the Institute of Maritime Studies and your passion for maritime education, this has been presented to you. Congratulations. We thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we're gradually winding down. And to thank us all is no other person but the director of the Institute of Maritime Studies, Professor Matthew O. Ilori, FAS. Please come to the podium, sir. I'd like to appreciate God Almighty who made today a reality. For over two years, we have been planning this lecture. As you are aware, we have had two seasons of postponement. But God, in his infinite mercy, made it a reality. So all praises and adoration goes to God, who kept every one of us through the thick and thin. We thank God Almighty. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, I would like to thank the Minister of State in absentia who had to leave for finding time to join us to celebrate maritime education. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the Minister who also could not make it here, but we were expecting him. Um, he was here at the turning of sword of the building that the Master donated to us. So on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and all of us at the Institute of Maritime Studies, we send our appreciation. I want to thank the Vice Chancellor herself, Professor Fola Shadi Ogunshola, for her passion, her patience. Uh, as a mother, she listens to us all the time, and she's ever willing to help for us to go very, very far. Uh, Ma, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. I want to thank the representative of the chairman uh, who uh, could not make it here. Uh, we missed her, but she was well represented by Mrs. Soji Okusonya. Uh, you are welcome, Ma. Thanks for the, I mean, the, all that you have done today. You gave us very good insight into what the lecturer uh, presented to us. Thank you so much. It's my greatest honor and privilege to thank the lecturer of today, Dr. Jamo, who stepped out. Uh, Dr. Jamo is someone who is so passionate about maritime education. As Vice Chancellor mentioned in our address, he had been part of this from the beginning. And I'm happy that the very first lecture of the Institute, the public lecture of the Institute, he delivered it and he's given us a lot of promises. Among the students who are here, he has promised that internship will be regularly available. Let's put our hands together for him. Thank you, sir, wherever you are. I hope you can hear us. We want to thank the DVC. Oh, okay, he's here. You're welcome, sir. I want to, once again, let me just repeat what I said so that you can hear me loud and clear. 
I wanted to unfold some of the promises you made. I started with the promises to the students, because they are here. So you came so that they will see you flesh and blood. So they will be coming to you, sir. And I know your hands are wide, your doors are widely open unto them. So the, the DG is expecting you anytime. Thank you, sir, for all the promises. The building will come on stream by the grace of God. Nothing will cut it short. Thank you, sir. So I want to thank the DVCs uh, for their patience, their support, the registrar, the bursar, the librarian, uh, all of the members of the University of Lagos who are here, both staff and students. I also would like to appreciate the board members from Nimasa. I want to thank the representative of the uh, the MD of NPA who is here, who, has, who came so early and who patiently uh, has been waiting. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to appreciate all the deans, the HODs who are here, and all of my colleagues from the different faculties. Thank you. I will reiterate this appreciation to Professor Bello and Professor Ogundipe. Uh, Professor Ayogunye was here, he's gone. Uh, I'm sending this appreciation to you on behalf of every one of us at the Institute of Maritime Studies. I want to appreciate the lecturers of the Institute of, of Maritime Studies. Without them, we would not have gone this far. They have been with us through thick and thin, and we know how we manage ourselves, the managers, and the managers. Thank you so much for your support. God bless you. Um, all the stakeholders who came with the DG, thank you, thank you, and thank you. God bless you. God bless the University of Lagos. God bless the Institute of Maritime Studies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. The slides of the lecture is already available for you to download on the DG's Twitter handle. And I was asking um, his MPA, that, are you sure he has a Twitter handle? He said yes because that is where we operate now. So please go to at Jamo Bashir and at Nimasa Official. The slides are there, you can download and you can read better and understand better and know when you want to go and meet him, what you have to say. Thank you very much. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's time to go. And once again, it's been a beautiful afternoon in the University of Lagos. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. And let's thank IMS and University of Lagos for the maiden edition of this seminar. We will stand up while we take the closing prayer. We will say the words of the second stanza of our national anthem as our closing prayers. We will then take the University of Lagos anthem, followed by the national anthem. I also crave your indulgence. Please clear the aisle so that our distinguished guests can recess out of this auditorium. Thank you very much. So let's take the second stanza of our national anthem. O oh God of creation, direct our noble course. Guide our leaders right. Help our youth the truth to know. In love and honesty to grow. And live in just and truth. Great lofty heights attain. To build a nation where peace and justice shall reign. Amen. University of Lagos Anthem.
Thank you very much. Please kindly clear the aisle so that our distinguished guests can leave the auditorium. Thank you. Let our students please stay behind so that we can direct you to where you are supposed to go.